deleted. Let's go. I had a delete. Come on. What a day. What a day. So I deleted effing fans by Drake. Off certified lover boy. Okay. I don't need it in my library. And you want to know what I was rewarded by? What? The song that came next, Bills, Bills, Bills by Destiny's Good Child. Song. Excellent. What a what song. a song for Women's History Month. What a song for Women's History Month. And what a reminder that if you delete a very mid song, you can be blessed with a great song after. Also, maybe the best use, not the best use, I think it was probably the first time I ever heard the word trifling as a child. Oh, really? Probably, you know. You trifling, mean? good for nothing type, type of, of brother. brother. Like they, they really wanted to say mother bleeper. Baller. When times get hard, at least one to help me out <laughs> instead of a scrub like you who don't know what a man's about. Can you pay, pay my, my bills? Can, Can you pay, pay my telephone bills? Bill? Can you pay, pay my automobile? Oh, what a great use of that, too. My automobiles. Automobiles. <laughs> automobiles. Oh. Sweetheart, it's a car note. I don't think you <laughs> do. So, so you and me are through. Ba -da 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 -da. It's a great song. Great song. And then it went straight from, I don't know why my drive took so long. I hit every light. <laughs> it went in as I was walking in. I got another Beyonce song. I got Break My Soul, which I love Break My Soul. So I don't know what my phone was telling me today. On the, you want to know what it's telling me? It's Beyonce week. Beyonce's new album comes out Friday. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're going to feed that to you because they know. They know. They Apple know. knows. They know. They threw me a little Drake. They said, move on. It's all Beyonce from say. here. What's up, everybody? It is Tuesday, March 26th. Going to be a good day. Jessica Benson with you from the Grind City Media Studios in Memphis, Tennessee. CJ Hurt behind the glass. Coming up on today's show, I did something yesterday that I don't think I have ever done before, and it involved Caitlin Clark, Juju Watkins, Hannah Hidalgo, Paige Beckers, Rakia Jackson, all of the incredible women's basketball games yesterday. The Women's Sweet 16 is set. The Grizzlies also played last night. They lost in Denver to the Nuggets. Just 10 games remaining for the Grizzlies season. Mike Wallace is going to join us about 20 minutes in. I'll ask him if he learned anything from the Grizzlies' loss last night. I will also talk to him about the big NBA story, the betting investigation into Jonte Porter and what it could mean for the NBA, for sports betting, all of that and more. Gary Parish is going to join us on a Tuesday about 40 minutes in. We'll get his thoughts on the men's Sweet 16, any of the games that stood out from him. From the first weekend, we'll also get into some coaching news with GP as well. And then we'll do some TV Tuesday. We're talking about the Nickelodeon documentary, other things we are watching along the way. Let's have some fun. Let's go. Justin Timberlake. I'm bringing sexy back. The Forget Tomorrow World Tour. Live in Memphis. Justin Timberlake. FedEx Forum, Saturday, November 23rd. Get tickets this Thursday at 10 a.m. at LiveNation.com. The brand new single, Selfish, is available to stream and download now. For more, hit up JustinTimberlake.com. Electric, rowdy, intense. They bring the same mentality that they bring anywhere into the building. If they were mad about something, they're bringing it in. If they were happy about something, they're bringing it in. So we need all that energy times a thousand. Real country music with Cody Johnson live Saturday, April 13th at FedEx Forum. Country's best, the Leather Tour, with Cody Johnson, with special guest Justin Moore, also featuring Drake Milligan. VIP and reserve seats on sale at Ticketmaster.com in the FedEx Forum box office. Cody Johnson. Don't worry, be fluffy world tour. The minute you get into a brand new relationship, like magic. You know who really notices just how happy you are, guys? Other women, not your woman. Look how happy he is. Oh, I bet I can change that. 
Friday, May 10th, FedEx Forum. Get your tickets now at FluffyGuy.com. Don't miss a Memphis. Don't worry, be Fluffy World Tour. We know there's only one team you want to watch, and Valley Sports is the place to get your Grizzlies. Experience the comebacks, the buzzer beaters, the can't-miss Memphis made moments live. Valley Sports keeps the grind going before and after the game, too, with Pete, Brevin, Fish, and Chris on Grizzlies Live. Watch Grizzlies basketball all season long with Valley Sports and streaming on the Valley Sports app. Valley Sports, home of the only team you want to watch. You saw with four seconds for the win. Yes! Marcus, one of the more competitive people you'll meet. He ain't lose. That willingness to go out and try to compete every day, not just wait for a game, not wait for a regular season game, not wait for a playoff game, but every day is what made Mark special. He was a big part of that identity, right? And a big part of that's why the, the team was so successful, because he had that anchor in him. Grizzlies, to this day, wouldn't be the Grizzlies without the contribution of Marcus Gasol. Presents the Jessica Benson Show with CJ Hurt live from the Grind City Media Studios on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Happy Tuesday, everybody! Hope you had a good start to the week. It was a rainy and a windy Monday in Memphis. CJ, I thought my patio furniture was going to pew. Blow away. I consider putting a weight on it. Yeah. We got Costco patio furniture. What? Oh, yeah. Do we ever sit on it? Oh, no. Oh, wow. The cushions live inside. Yeah, it, the that's where they The furniture lives outside. And okay. so the act of having to put all the cushions on the furniture, maybe we'll do it more this year. I was still going through the whole Achilles thing last spring when it's like perfect patio weather and it just faces a parking lot. So it's not like we're really looking at anything nice. But anyway, our patio furniture is alive. It was windy. 55 mile per hour winds yesterday. Uh, we've got no. a we've got a patio set that I keep in the shed and then I just break it out for company. And then we've got some porch furniture that is really uncomfortable. My wife, my wife bought it. She loves it though. It looks pretty. That's part of why she loves it. And so that that's sturdy enough yeah. to just live outside. I'm not gonna be lifting that, bringing that in and out. For for stuff, I thought oh, about I sitting on the porch during when the rain first started coming mm -hmm. down yesterday. Still, just a, a touch too, just a smidge too cold. But it's mm, it's so about close. to be about to be porch sitting weather for mm, you, boy. It's so close. Even porch rain sitting weather. Uh, good news. Ten Grizzlies games remain in this season. They played the Nuggets last night. We will talk about their loss with Mike Wallace in the next segment. Uh, what those kind of matchups, Nikola Jokic. Stop me if you heard this one before. Had himself a game, but what those kind of matchups can teach us about the Grizzlies and perhaps what they'll be looking for this offseason. If there have been any NCAA tournament performances that have caught Mike Wallace's eye, we will get into all of that with him. I did want to start today's show with how I spent yesterday because I saw a lot of people begin their Monday by saying, finally, I can breathe. I can take a break. I have watched so much basketball over the last weekend and some change, and now I can just... Take a little ball break, but that would be inaccurate. Those people were delusional because there were eight women's second round games yesterday. And I watched all five of the ones that were on ESPN back to back to back to back to back. And I was sitting there up far past my bedtime for a fifth straight night watching the USC Kansas game. And it was a little too close for comfort until late in that game when USC blew it open. But I was thinking to myself, I don't think that I have ever consumed an early round of the women's tournament in the same way that I consume the men's tournament. And by that, I mean staying locked in 
on the TV all day long, watching the games on the other channels to see if there was one that I needed to switch to. The UCLA Creighton game was really close. But from the time that I got home from work and errands and everything yesterday afternoon, it was about halfway through the Notre Dame Ole Miss game. And so I sat down and I watched Hannah Hidalgo just methodically, relentlessly keep Ole Miss from getting back in that game. And shout out to Coach Neil Ivey, forever a Memphis Grizzly, now with Notre Dame. And then from there, it went immediately into Tennessee NC State. And Tennessee came back down 20 in that game. Rakia Jackson, 33 points. She's going to go to the W next year. She was tremendous for the Vols. Tennessee comes up just a little bit short. NC State advance. From there, we go into what was a big game in our household, the UConn-Syracuse game. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself what Paige Becker's could have would have been if she hadn't been injured for two years because she is that girl and you have Gino Ariema after the game saying she is the best player in college basketball right now but she's going back and forth with Daeja Fair for Syracuse who's just a total bucket and at one point they're trading threes and they're trading tough shots and I'm like yes this is what this is all about and UConn ends up beating Syracuse then you get to Iowa West Virginia and you leave that game and anyone outside of Iowa City, Iowa, hates women's officiating this morning, and so many people are getting fed up with Caitlin Clark's antics, and I'm watching the discourse take off from Iowa's barely their win and thinking, oh my god, the game is leveling up to another part of its, you know, situation within the sports community. And then we ended the night with USC Kansas with one of the prettiest red and gold jersey combinations I have ever seen, and I'm thinking to myself, I think Gigi Watkins is the best of all of these. I think she's the best player that I've watched in these five tremendous women's basketball games. And it was just so cool. And I'm thinking to myself watching these very, very full arenas and obviously the home court advantage conversation has become a thing following the Iowa game and we had the LSU game over the weekend. Um, And even you had Coach Joe at Ole Miss making some comments about their game against Notre Dame. But I loved being so invested in the first weekend of the women's tournament. And all five of those games delivered. The other games outside of it did as well. The Sweet 16 is set. But I think a lot of people watched last night. If you didn't watch any, I'm not saying you had to be psychotic like me. I understand. I have a problem. Um, If you don't watch any of the games yesterday and you claim that you love basketball, no, no, you're just being silly at this point. I'm sorry. When are we going to stop doing that to people? What? That. Like what? Like, hey, this this thing is really, really good. Come watch if you didn't. Because there are still so many well, people them, who refuse well, I think, I think to get just, in on the curve. I think we just let them be. Like you'll come when you come. If if last night's action isn't, isn't intriguing enough for you, if the the twenty point comeback by Tennessee isn't intriguing enough for you, if the play of uh, Caitlin Clark, the play of Paige Beckers, at the play of Edwards for UConn isn't enough of you for you, if what Juju did at USC isn't enough for you. It's, it's just not for yeah. you. You're just not going to come. We don't do this with baseball, I don't yeah, but it's think. Different. Right? Like, it's I, entirely nobody's different. Nobody's trying to shame me into watching baseball. You couldn't shame me into watching baseball. You can't shame me into watching MLS, right? right. Those are things sure. I'm just not going to watch. Yeah. I'm not. Now, basketball, I will sit down and watch basketball. I watched a good portion of all of those games. I'm not like you. Let me be clear. That's fine. When it's bedtime, Few are. It's, it's bedtime. <laughs> I didn't get to stay Built up and different. see the, the, the late Juju game. I saw the Tennessee game. I saw UConn. And I saw the first three quarters of Iowa men go to quarters, by the way. Saw the first three <laughs> quarters of Iowa and uh, West Virginia. And it was like, okay, yeah, I can shut it down now. I can rest peacefully knowing I watched some incredible uh, basketball. But I think that the, the true growth will measure growth in a lot of different ways when it comes to this year's women's basketball tournament already it's the most i I do believe it's the highest attended women's basketball uh first two rounds i do believe that we'll see that it'll be one of the most viewed on television first two rounds for the women's tournament that's one way of measuring growth but i think the true way of measuring growth is we just all sit in a space where hey we're going to watch this game you can watch it or you cannot and we'll just leave it at that i just get lost in the piece of it where there's this separation still of people who claim that they love 
the sport because we're talking about basketball. We're not talking about baseball. We're not talking about soccer. We're talking about basketball. And then I want to move on from this because I agree with you. I, I think it's a wasted, it's wasted breath. It's wasted space. And at this point, if people can't get with it, they can get on the train later, whatever. The, the train is always welcome for more people who claim that they love the sport of basketball. But what I'm saying is from those five games yesterday, and sometimes the women's tournament has been uh, criticized isn't the right word, but just the acknowledgement of those early rounds not being as good. It usually picks up on the second weekend or picks up Final Four weekend. And that's been my experience consuming the women's tournament in the past where I've popped in for a first or second round game here or there. But for the most part, I'm really coming into it when those marquee matchups get set. But there are so many more marquee matchups now. And that is a testament to the growth and the parity within the sport. And you almost saw Iowa get upset by West Virginia, just like for three quarters, or I'll say for two and a fourth quarter, you saw that MTSU almost upset LSU over the weekend and these big name programs. You could literally like feel ESPN and ABC execs living and dying with every Iowa make and miss because for them, they want Iowa there so badly, but there are enough challengers that it's not a guarantee, which adds to the intrigue and adds to the drama of it all. And that Iowa West Virginia game was incredible. And you walk away from it and you're like, all right, well, that sets up an Iowa-Colorado rematch from last year. Two teams that played. They have one more game before they would eventually meet LSU, who will have to get past UCLA. And there's all this talent. But Caitlin Clark has emerged as this all-encompassing face of college basketball. And what I found from those five games yesterday is there are so many, and I already knew this, but there are so many stars of the sport that Caitlin Clark deserves every. Leading scorer in college basketball history. But man, you take Juju, you take Paige, you take Hannah Hidalgo, you take that Daeja Fair, who Paige Beckers is out there saying also one of the best shooters in the game. Like the star power is just so loaded that we've entered this place where it doesn't just have to be a gimmick of Caitlin Clark. There's actual incredible basketball and performances across the board. Um, I know you want to move on, but sure. last, last thought on that. I know people, I don't know anybody who will admit to liking men's college basketball and the NBA, right? Like, they, it's always whenever I'm talking to somebody, they will pick one and be like, oh, I can't watch the college game because they're not good enough, or oh, I can't watch the NBA. It's too much one-on-one. -on -one, they're too soft. So I think this is just what we do with this sport where we're nitpicking we're these things, <laughs> yeah. which is weird. It's stupid, but whatever. You do you. Um I thought that that was the best game. Nah, I thought that was the best game I've seen Paige Beckers play with my own two Me eyes. Me too. Oh, my that God. Was, that was – if, if Paige if Paige could have been that, mm -hmm. if Paige is going to be that, I might be willing to hop on that Paige Beckers train. I need to see it again. But the way she was defending, the way that she was creating shots for others, the way she was getting to the paint and finishing, the way she was shooting the ball, I, I can see why Gino is comparing her – to Stewie. To the grace. Right? Yeah. Like, it's, it's hey, she does some of everything at a really high level. Where, whereas, like, a Diana Taurasi might do this one thing phenomenally. Mm -hmm. Diana Taurasi getting, getting buckets is just something special, a sight to behold. Whereas, Paige Beckers isn't going to give you that on a night-in, night-out basis. What she's going to give you is some of everything. Jack of all trades, right? Jack of all trades, master of none, better still than a master of one. Like, that's, yeah. that's Paige. That was... Incredible to see. That was my favorite game to, to watch yesterday. As a defender, yeah. picking up Deja Fair in the second half of that game, Otto from mid-range, every time Syracuse got any momentum, it was like Paige Becker shut it down. And it was a tremendous game. And then that going into the Iowa-West Virginia game where Iowa did not play their best game. And that, well, that that's Iowa. That is Iowa. Ba that right there, that yes. is Iowa basketball. That is the closest I've seen to 2008 Davidson. Where it is, hey, 08 Davidson's got one. And that one has to do all the scoring and has to give everybody else easy opportunities. Otherwise, nobody else can create. Right. Right. Like Steph Curry had nobody else who could create anything for themselves or for others. If you take uh, uh, Caitlin Clark off of Iowa, they're just going to pass. They're great passing the ball around the perimeter. They'll just pass the ball and keep it moving and do stuff, mm. but it won't really create anything for them. And then they'll end up having to take a really tough shot. You insert Clark into that. Now, Caitlin Clark can take the tough shot, and she can make it. Also, not only can she make it, she can create for others where she's giving you the ball. 
She's, those points shouldn't count towards our basketball players. They should all count towards Caitlin Clark because she's giving it to them, and they don't even have to dribble. They just catch it and go that's up with true, it. Right. Like, yeah, that's just what Iowa is, man. But I love that we have reached this point where, like, everybody's coming down on women's officiating outside of those who are actual it's Iowa rigged. basketball fans. It's, it's always rigged. been rigged. It's all, all we can rigged. all agree. Ah, da, 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 da. We can all agree, except for my beautiful agree. Iowa fans out there. And I love you so much. But Wait till they I'm lose. Sorry. Wait till I'm they sorry. lose. 30 free throws to five. And miss me with the, well, look at the game plan that West Virginia. Yes, of course. West Virginia is a defensive disruptive team. And they lead the nation in, I think, steals. And that was the game plan they went. They were going to go physical. They were going to just big body Iowa. And ultimately, Caitlin Clark gets to the line 12 times herself. That was the game plan to compete with Iowa, which is why I'm very intrigued by this Colorado matchup coming in the Sweet 16, because that's how CU's built, too. They're big. They're physical. They're a big rebounding team and perhaps could pose some problems for Iowa again. So all of that aside, how many times are we going to let Caitlin Clark push off? And then call it on the other side. What do you mean? How many times oh. are we what? going to go back and forth where Iowa is doing something and just, oh, well, is it, well, hold on, hold on. Is Iowa doing it or is Caitlin Clark doing it? Both. Okay. But it is not just, this okay. is not just, I'm not putting all the eggs all right. on the Caitlin Clark basket. Because that's like asking. This is the Iowa hey, as a what team. Are we, what are we going to call these offensive fouls on Zach Eady? When yeah. are we going to call three seconds on Zach? We're not. That's when. We're not. When you reach a certain <laughs> level, you get to play a different game. There's a story out so there funny. that I saw circulating about uh, I knew. I Donaghy. knew Lee Evans would be in the chat saying they took 35 threes and Iowa drove inside. Sure, facts. But you cannot tell me on that last. Even even the person with the, the biggest basketball brain in the world cannot watch that last and one by Caitlin Clark. The one where she said, oh, my God, the F word afterwards. And that's a whole other thing because God forbid we've seen this now twice in two days where people are losing their collective minds over a basketball player using the F word when we see players use an assortment of language all the well, time Jessica, and have Jessica, no Jessica, problem Jessica, with Jessica. it. That's unladylike. Shut up. Shut up. Oh, my God. I forget. Somebody the other day, who was it? Someone was like, Caitlin Clark just looks so, she doesn't look like she's having fun when she's out there. I'm, I'm sorry, are you telling her to smile more? Are you legitimately telling Caitlin Clark to smile more when she, she plays basketball? She, would look, aye, aye, she aye. would look so much prettier if she smiled, Jessica. It was not a foul on the and one that got her to the free throw line. And then Caitlin Clark overtakes the single season scoring record, which was great. And again, Caitlin Clark is awesome. I was awesome. All of this is good for the sport. Uh, but I loved seeing everybody bring out the pitchforks yesterday for officiating. And this comes after the similar free throw disparage, discrepancy between LSU and MTSU. And gotta get them do that. Gotta get them do that in saying, there. We, we gotta really, do it. Really, really we want to get them in. LSU elite eight. <laughs> The TVs need it. We need it. I need it. Listen, I'm all for it. West Virginia, good try. Good effort. Ultimately, we as a basketball community demand a game that you were unfortunately um, on the other side of it. I did spend a lot of that game trying to figure out if JJ Quinterly on West Virginia was related to Javon Quinterly from Memphis. I don't think they are, so that took some of my attention away. And then shout out to Jayla Hemingway, who was one of the best shooters I ever covered at Houston High School here in Memphis. She's on that uh, West Virginia team as well. So it was cool to hear her name called. West Virginia doesn't get the win. Iowa advances. Caitlin Clark is her and will continue to be, I swear, ESPN. ESPN, the home of women's, the women's uh, NCAA tournament. Led with Caitlin Clark. We love it. We love it. Didn't show another women's college basketball highlight until like 40 minutes into Sports Center this morning for another team. Like, they're on your network! Well, they, <laughs> they had two Caitlin Clark segments before they showed another game. Good. That's, there that's was another the one seed at play last night, CJ. The, who was that? The University of Southern California. Uh, nobody Did you see Caleb that, Williams no. was there? Did you see Matt Leinart was there? Ooh. Galen Center sold out. I did want to get, we have to get to Mike Wallace, who's kind enough to join us after a late night in Denver and Grizzlies Nuggets. <laughs> Jacob is bringing up a good what? point. He said all of the bus quarterbacks were, were there. Was Sanchez there? No. 
Was what's my other man? Darnold? No. They weren't where's, there. Where's Matt Barkley? When where's, you need where him? is where's Matt, Matt Barkley? Barkley? Do you even do you even watch women's basketball, Matt Barkley? Don't don't say this. Matt Barkley finds every time I talk about him despairingly and Clip I, it. I, I Clip cannot it. do it. I can't Matt, do it. Matt, we love you. Not really, but good luck to you. Matt, you absolutely did not yell at Chris Luther on the sidelines at MetLife Stadium once and tell him to get the F out of your face. Absolutely never happened. Wait, what never happened? Never happened. We'll talk about it someday. We I want to talk about season. it today. I wanted to say, for those who are saying that we should move on from neutral site or move to neutral site games for the women's tournament and that the sport has advanced out of home court advantage, I am so against that. I love the home court advantage in the first and second rounds. And I wish that the men's tournament would go to home court advantage. We are about to see it in the college football playoff where the early rounds are going to be played on campus. I think it adds an energy and electricity that is unmatched. The scene at Iowa last night of every crowd shot where it is gold and black striped, they are coordinated, they are there. They're staying after the game to give proper respect and flowers to this Iowa team for Caitlin Clark's final home game. It was a sight to behold, and every time they cut to a crowd shot, I just found myself being like, oh, that is so cool. And I don't want to take that away. Underdogs can still win. It makes it more difficult. You play for home field advantage. We see this in other sports all the time. We do not have to go to these big dollar middle of, I'm not going to say middle of nowhere because we know where those neutral sites would be. They'd be in New York. They'd be in LA. They'd be in big cities. Keep them on campus. I think it makes it so much better. And I loved seeing a sold out Galen Center at USC last night. That said, we have to take a quick break. Mike Wallace is going to join us on the other side. We will talk to him about Grizzlies Nuggets. We'll talk to him about this Jonte Porter situation in the NBA and all that and more when we come back. Take your fandom to the next level with the official Grizzlies app. Go all access and behind the scenes. It's got to be heavy defense. That's where it starts for us. Personalized to where you are and who you are. Get easy access to ticketing, the game day guide, and your own app customization right at your fingertips. Upgrade your experience and download the Grizzlies app today. LifeCare Ambulance is proud to be an official partner of the Memphis Grizzlies and FedEx Forum. At LifeCare, they wear their hearts with pride. Their passion is their people. They want you to love what you do and where you do it. Their employee-driven culture encourages a healthy work-life balance and supportive work environment. They invest in your success and well-being so that you can provide the best care for the patients that they serve. Join the incredible team of EMTs and paramedics in Memphis, Nashville, and across the nation today. Learn more at LifeCareAMB.com. Anticipate each challenge, make a quick response, capitalize on every opportunity, and win. Greatness won't wait. It's true in basketball. It's true in banking. Grizzlies checking from Pinnacle. Play hard. Bank easy. Open a Grizzlies checking account with at least $100 and a recurring direct deposit by April 30th. And you could receive a $200 direct deposit bonus into your account. Details at grizzliesbanking.com. Member FDIC. When it's all on the line, you turn to the strong, the stable, the unwavering, to those with a history of raising their performance to meet the moment. It's true in basketball. It's true in banking. Grizzlies checking from Pinnacle. Play hard, bank easy. Open a Grizzlies checking account with at least $100 and a recurring direct deposit by April 30th. And you could receive a $200 direct deposit bonus into your account. Details at grizzliesbanking.com. Member FDIC. Vince Williams is going to go to All-Star Weekend. Now, what a great thing for him. Kudos to, to Vince Williams Jr. You know, um, he was an injury replacement on the Panini Rising Stars. He'll get a chance to be part of the All-Star Weekend Showcase. Hey, Grizzlies fans, be sure to tune in to Grisby, where the panel and I break down all things Grizzlies and take a look at the rest of the NBA as well. The show is live every Wednesday, 2 p.m. on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Now for a limited time, the new $1.99 Crispy Tender Wraps are here at Sonic. Who could deny a crispy chicken tender with bold flavors like hickory barbecue and cheesy Baja? And we can't forget the crisp lettuce and melty cheese to make the perfect bite. Wrap yourself up with some TLC, tender, love, and chicken for only $1.99. Sonic $1.99 Crispy Tender Wraps. Tax not included, limited time only at participating Sonic drive-ins. 
this is an actual good shoe. Yeah, it looks like, like a good a shoe. real good shoe. What yeah. you think about them, uh, KJ? She <laughs> likes Cheetos. <laughs> like Cheetos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Cheetos? You like Cheetos? For kids, yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. For kids, 1,000%. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And honestly, if I was still playing basketball, I like I played in brightly colored shoes. I, I wore pink shoes a lot of the yeah. time or purple shoes. Like, I like that. The Sneak Fest Show, live Tuesdays at 2 p.m. on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Welcome back, welcome back. It is Tuesday, so it is time to catch up with Mike Wallace of Grind City Media. He was at last night's Grizzlies Nuggets game. Mike, are you back in Memphis? Are you still in Denver? Where are we? No, nah, we're still, still, we're still in, in Denver. Denver. <laughs> we're still in Denver. Uh, we leave this morning to get back to Memphis. It's been a long trip. You know, obviously, uh, it's, it's hard to end a trip when you go against the defending champion Denver Nuggets. And last night looked like a night where the Grizzlies were looking forward to getting on this plane and heading back. Uh, to end the trip quickly. <laughs> yes, as I heard, they were leading into the highlights on Sports Center this morning, and they said this Grizzlies team struggling to the finish line. And I thought to myself, we are all struggling to the finish line. Ten games left in this season, and last night in Denver, no Jamal Murray, Mike, but Nicole Jokic did play, and per usual, Nicole Jokic did dominate. I am curious as we look at you know things to take away of this last slate of games for the Grizzlies this season before we turn the page into preparation for next year. Is there anything that stands out to you when you see Jokic have a game like last night that perhaps allows you to read the tea leaves a little bit on what the Grizzlies could and should do when it comes to finding that front court partner for Jaron? You know, when I looked at that game and, and Eric Hasseltine and I were on the radio call last night and, you know, the way Jokic started that game, it was a real professional approach. He showed from the outset that he was dominant. And what I kept saying, I said during the broadcast, is that it's not just enough for, for John Morant and Marcus Smart and, and these guys to sit on the bench and say, all right, when we get back, we'll be right here. No, getting back healthy is step one. Elevating your game to a championship level, which the Grizzlies have yet to show, is step two, three, four, and five. So just because you're healthy doesn't mean you're going to automatically operate like a, two, like a defending champion. Uh, who's led by a three-time defending MVP. So there's some layers to this, man. And Denver's playing at the absolute peak of its powers. You go back to last year, Jessica, and you saw this too. Denver kind of limped towards the finish line. The Grizzlies almost caught them for the number one seed uh, because they had a nice lead, you know, uh, in the standings. And then they kind of just faded down the stretch. Michael Malone had to whip his team back into shape uh, to make sure they took the playoff seriously. You're not seeing that right now. Denver's playing his best basketball as we get closer to the postseason. Uh, one of the highlights from last night's game, or I wouldn't call it a highlight, but videos that came out from last night's game before we move from the Nuggets into the Grizzlies uh, was Nikola Jokic catching the ball and attempting from the backcourt to shoot from the free throw line and draw a shooting foul. This has become somewhat of a consistent attempt from Nikola Jokic for the last nine years he has never convinced an official to do the right thing mike and call it i'm saying this from the grizzlies are the team on the other side but that's a foul he was in the motion of shooting when the foul happened do you think he will ever get it will an no. official ever say you know what this one's for you Jokic? I, the only circumstance in which he will get that is if there's three two or one second left on the clock and it's obvious a shooting situation no matter where you are on the floor but if it's like you know a half court heave at the buzzer yes that's a foul and it's a shooting foul you get three free throws otherwise there's no way Jokic mm -hmm. is going to make a shot from that distance he's made, he's made he's made no he, he can make a shot from that distance but it's not going to be drawn up for him to make a shot from that distance <laughs> uh, he's definitely going to make a million dimes from that distance and we've seen him make all kind of passes and crazy assists from uh, you know, 60, 70 feet from the court. I mean, it's just been beautiful. He's a beautiful player to watch. He's perfected the game. The only thing I, I, I worry about is that, you know, in Jaron Jackson's case, he had a chance to really put some pressure on Jokic and make him defend. And, you know, after a couple of initial attempts, you know, Jaron just wasn't in his game and wasn't, wasn't on his game. So it's one of those deals where Jokic is almost indefensible. Well, you know he's indefensible, right. but you got to figure out a way to make him work on the defensive side. How, how 
do you do that? We see bigger, like wider dudes give Jaron a lot of problems. And so the, the thing that Jaron usually does, like problems physically on the block, right? He's not going <laughs> to post up on the block and be able to handle the physicality from bigger bigs. But what Jaron has been doing so well most of this year is, okay, you're bigger, you're probably slower, I'm going to pull you out and then try and go by you. And yesterday, it just felt little right. wonky with Jaron. How much of that, Mike, is just Jaron having an off night versus what Jokic and what the Denver Nuggets were doing to him defensively? Well, well, Jaron beat Jokic in the foul trouble, so that made Jaron a little bit more passive. When they, I mean, he tried to be aggressive early, but when he got into foul trouble before Jokic did, it gave Jokic the advantage. But, you know, in, in, my, in my limited knowledge of, of basketball, what I would see in that situation is isolating Jaron on the opposite post let him operate, clear out old school Charles Barkley style, and then let him, you know, face up or back down, force the double team to come and then pass out of that. Make him a playmaker closer to the basket. And if no one comes to double, then let Jaren go to operate. He's faster than Jokic. He can make more lateral moves than Jokic. But if he's not put in a situation or put himself in a situation where he has the space to do that, it's going to be tough they against had, Jokic or any other big that, that's uh, physical like that. The Nuggets had that that driving lane, maybe not necessarily the paint, but the lane to drive, they mm -hmm. kept dudes in his way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we saw Jaron settle for a, a lot of threes last night, whereas in other games, he's been able to put the ball on the floor. If the three's not falling, great, I'll put the ball on the floor and get to the rim. He, the Nuggets were just like, no, nah, we're, we're not going to allow that. And where I think the guys on the bench coming back helps, Mike, is – like, you're not going to play that way if Ja's on the court. You're not going to be able to play that way if Marcus Smart is is on the court, if Luke Kennard is on the court. That's going to clear some of those driving lanes up for, for Jaren. Yeah, it's going to clear the lanes up, but but it also doesn't uh, mean that Jaren has to stay 25, 30 feet outside the lane starting his moves. Like, I think he's more effective when he's a lot closer to the basket, and he doesn't have to drive around guys and create two, three, four dribble opportunities to get to the rim. Even if against he, a player the size of Jokic. Yeah. Right? If, even if, even if, against if, like a bigger, thicker, big, like a, a yeah. Jokic, a Jonas, uh, Steven Adams comes to mind also. Even against mm -hmm. one of those type bigs, he's still, uh -huh. you still think he can do damage closer to the rim. Closer like to where the rim. And, the I'm ball. Not saying, and I'm not saying on the block. I'm not saying post up on the block where obviously you're mitigating your speed factor. What I'm saying is high post, mid post, you know, um, um, elbow area. So basically it becomes a catch one, two move as opposed to a face up from the three point line, dribble three times so that the help can come and see you. A lot of times Jaron gets doubled and he, his lanes are eliminated because he's starting so far out from the lane and he's, and guys can see his move. Like you can see him coming and you just wall up from that situation. But you know, he's, he's versatile enough and talented enough to mix that up. But to your larger point, CJ, when Jaws in the game, Jaws going to handle the ball, and he's going to put Jaron in positions where the double is going to come to Ja, and Jaron is going to have the open opportunities or the single coverage opportunities. So that's and then you got Luke Kennard as a threat for a skip pass and a three point shot. So you're a far more dynamic team when Jaron has those guys on the floor than what he has to do as the number one option right now. Mike, you guys have been on the road for what feels like forever, um, but yeah. also throughout the entirety of the men's NCAA tournament. I wanted to give you personally a shout out. Grambling did get their first win in the first four and then promptly exited in the first round. But I'm curious, how much of the NCAA tournament have you been able to watch? And, and if any or, or what you've seen from it, if there were any players who stood out to you as we are in this evaluation period of trying to figure out what the Grizzlies will be doing uh, when it comes to whatever pick they end up with after the NBA draft lottery. And if there have been any standouts where you think to yourself, hmm, this player intrigues me a little bit more than the rest. Well, I, I will say this because, and thanks for the shout out for Grambling. They got their win in the first four. And then, you know, so far, so far, they've done the best defensive job <laughs> that you can do, you know what I'm saying, uh, in, in terms of what you're looking at in terms of Purdue. Purdue is just rolling. And, you know, the more I see Edie play, um, I, I'm like, yo, there's got to be a way this guy's going to be impactful in the NBA. And, and I kept thinking, you know, uh, the fact that he's so big, he's such a, a force that you can't stop him from catching the ball in the mm -hmm. paint. And, you know, he rebounds so well. So he's been impressive, man, just because of the way he's – he's playing better now than I've ever seen him play. I don't watch a lot of college basketball. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. If you guys had run up to me with those microphones the way y'all did in that skit, <laughs> asking people who uh, – can you name one college basketball player? 
I would have been stuck, right? So it's like, you know, now I'm mm. starting to dive deeper in to these guys that the Grizzlies are obviously going to be bringing in and looking at. You know, we'll be at the draft combine uh, in Chicago in, in May uh, to interview these guys and see them play and see them work out. And then we'll have a better knowledge of it. But, you know, the bigs right now, you know, I mean, Edie is making the name for himself. And I think he's climbing up some draft boards because if this guy, and, and I'm not saying this to be controversial or anything like yeah. that, but I couldn't help to think with the way he's playing, if he was an African-American or if he was black, he'd be a lottery pick. He'd be a lottery pick. No, he would. we wouldn't. Yes, we would. Yes, no, we would. not he at 7-4 playing CJ, like that, Mike. CJ, 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 listen before you disagree, yo. I mean, let me let me present my information when it comes to that. This guy, and, and I know the game has changed, but the game was still up and down and fast-paced when Roy Hibbert came into the league. You know where Roy Hibbert was picked? Top 15. You know, uh, a, a guy that was even a bust, like the Grizzlies had to pick Hashim to beat. You know where he was picked? Top three. Zach Eady is a better player and more balanced than Roy Hibbert and you know, Hashim to beat when it comes to that. He's a dominant big man. And again, if he were in a different situation, he would be looked at a lot differently. He would be looked at as a lot more athletic and a lot more NBA ready than being, you know, a tall, big white guy. I'm not saying he's going to come to the league and dominate. But what I'm saying is that when you see his type, his prototype, and historically what that has meant, you know, a, a lot of guys have come into the league. You know, Brendan Haywood, a lot of these guys have come into the league uh, with a lot less mobility and talent than Zach Eady, and they've been higher picks. So I'll see what he does in the combine. I'm not saying it to be controversial. I'm just saying, I'm being honest. That just passed through my mind as I watched him with the way he's played in these two NCAA tournament games. Greg Oden comes to mind. Like, think about it. Greg Oden was the number one pick overall in the NBA. Does Zach Eady look worse than Greg Oden? Yes. Yes, yes, well, he, the yes game, he, he looks in the, NCAA, Greg Oden. in the NCAA and, tournament. Yeah, in the and, NCAA tournament. Yes, Greg Oden had a hell of a run through the NCAA tournament when he came through. And the game has changed so much in the past, what, five years where it is up, down, three point shooting. My question is is he, is he Walker Kessler, right? Is he that type mm -hmm. of big? where he can be big, he can catch lobs, roll into the rim, or he can get to the open spot, roll into the rim, and where he can defend the rim at a high level. And I don't think Zach Eady can. I think what we're seeing from Zach Eady is a guy who is a great college basketball player, don't get me wrong, right? Phenomenal college basketball player, but like that, there's no quickness there from Zach Eady. I think that you can go out in the NBA, which is a game of skill, right? The NBA is a game the difference in NBA and college basketball is just how skilled everybody is on the court. And if you put Zach Eady out there, I think he gets gobbled up in pick and roll situations. I don't think that he gives you any sort of real threat on offense. So now you've got a guy who can just camp out in the in the paint uh, as a as a rim defender. And I don't know where any easy shots come from with Zach Eady out there. And I'm not sure how good a rebounder he is against bigger. Uh, more athletic competition than what he's facing Grambling and uh, the Big Ten this year, right? So that that's my knock on Zach Eady. Somebody might take him. I'd be surprised if they took him. He'll be he'll get an opportunity. He will absolutely get an opportunity to prove me wrong. I just don't see it. I just feel like that's where there's a difference between someone like a Donovan Klingon from UConn who fits more as a modern or how we see bigs today and his growth as being able to not just be someone who strictly works on the post. He's become far better of a finisher in transition. He's become a better roller. What he does as an elite shot blocker in college basketball, one of the best rebounders in college basketball, watching that UConn team, I get like, oh, I'm like, ooh. Donovan Klingon. Like, I see that fu that future is more clear to me of Donovan Klingon making an impact potentially for a team early on in an NBA career, where for Zach Eady, I feel like I have to do more mental gymnastics around it. And uh, maybe you're right from a standpoint of there's inherent bias with it. And it feels like Zach Eady has been there for such a significant period of time. And I haven't seen his game grow as much. I am not watching every single Purdue basketball game to ever exist. I'm also not sitting here saying Zach Eady is only good because he is tall. I know there are far more skills that allow him to be successful, potential back-to-back -back player of the year in college basketball. Um, it just isn't as obvious to me when it comes to Edie. I, I, hey, listen, all of, I'm, I'm not saying that he's going to get to the league and be Jaron Jackson Jr. or Anthony Davis. I'm not saying that he fits the mold of what we say is the modern sure. big. I'm not saying that. I'm saying he is what he is. And when you have that kind of size, that kind of stature, and you're that close to the – no, he's got, not going to be able to defend point guards on pick and rolls. You, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying present what he can't do. 
I'm saying what he can do. And if he's on the floor and he's able to stretch and get his get, if you throw it into him in the post, the way he's playing in the NCAA tournament through these two games, I'm saying that I have never seen him play like this. And I'm saying that if he can continue to show this, then he's going to gain more and more traction because teams aren't going to say, hey, let's bring Zach Eady in here to be, like I said, you know, uh, uh, Carl Anthony Town. But is, if he's available to be a regular big and get to the NBA level, and I said before, my main point was that if he was African-American, I think he would be looked at a lot more differently. I think he would be higher up on some guy's board because of that. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with race or bias, anything like that. I'm just saying the fact of the matter is the way he's playing in this NCAA tournament, I've seen guys climb in from non-draftable to lottery picks based on how the run that they made through the NCAA tournament. If he keeps this up and Purdue wins the championship, Zach Eady is going to make himself a lot more money than people are giving him credit for so far. When's the last time we've thrown the ball to a dude on the block? Forget this, Mike, but mm-hmm. we're, we're disagreeing to, to the end on that conversation. When the hell is the last time somebody threw the ball to a dude on the block? Like Jen, the Grizzlies are doing with Jaron every mm-hmm. now and then. Mm-hmm. Like, is there is there another big Joel Embiid? Embiid. Do are mm-hmm. we throwing it to Bam on the block? Bam seems like he's catching the ball like high post area. Bam is a different kind of big though, man. Jokic is a guy they throw it to him I on the mid post, say, the high post yeah. all the time. But he's not Jokic. Like the, the, I'm the not talking about Edie anymore. Is, I'm just is Jonas yeah. still getting it on the block? Yeah, Jonas, Jonas is. Yeah. Jonas is. That's Absolutely. the last. We, Jonas is still yeah. getting getting on you know, the block. Jonas still gets it on the block. You know, Carl Anthony Towns catches it in the block a lot. You know, they don't look for him to score from the block uh, for much because he's more of a face-up guy. But, you you know, I mean, guy, time after time, you're finding guys who are able to do that. Sabonis gets the ball on the block. Like, I can give you five, six, seven, eight bigs who are catching it and doing double-doubles and doing big things. Yo, uh, Sabonis is not a shooter. He's not. He's a more of a paint catcher and finisher in that situation. Again, different teams play styles differently. So it's not it's not a foregone conclusion that everybody's playing like, you know, five smalls and, and, and running up and down a court. When was the last, I'll tell you what, when was the last team outside of Golden State that's won it doing it that way? Tell me. Give me a team that's won it doing it that way, uh, you know, playing all super small outside of Golden State. Every other team has had somebody that can catch have a double-double in the post, do things, and you can play out of the post with. And I'm not saying that's the way the league is trending back toward. But what I'm saying is that this thing about bigs being obsolete, that's not the case anymore. Joel Embiid and Nikola Jokic have been MVPs four straight years running now, and they play a certain way. That's different from what the modern NBA is doing. Mike, I cannot let you go without asking you about Brandon Clark, who didn't play last night in Denver. He was upgraded to doubtful on the injury report, then was ruled out last night. But we know how injury reports for the Grizzlies have trended to go. You go from doubtful, where you're probably not going to play. Eventually, we will see a questionable next to Brandon Clark's name, and that will mean that he could be likely to play. What are you getting on the trend of BC's potential availability when the Grizzlies come back home tomorrow against the Lakers? Well, I mean, obviously, he went through another work series of workouts. I think Denver being here in the altitude for three days, for three different days of workouts and different uh, things that he was doing helped his conditioning because he's out here in the altitude. That was his last hurdle that he told me he wanted to get his conditioning and his win right. Um, to see him go through the workout yesterday, uh, you know, before the game on that same floor where he, you know, unfortunately tore his Achilles, to come all the way back full circle was, was a beautiful moment to see. Um, and, and he had a big smile on his face, man. He was nervous. He felt like he was playing in his first NBA game when he went out there for the workout. Um, everything is trending towards him being questionable uh, for tomorrow's game against the Lakers. And when he's out there, like I said before, there's no question in his mind that if he's questionable, he's going to be out there playing and trying to give it a go. Uh, you just don't want to give him too much because the adrenaline is going to take over. Uh, but they do expect for him to be uh, available, barring any kind of snag or any kind of delay or setback tomorrow against the Lakers. And if anything should should slow that down, then obviously Saturday in Orlando will be the game after that. All right, Mike Wallace, thank you as always for joining us. We'll see you back in Memphis soon. Have a safe trip back. Absolutely. Take care, guys. That was Mike Wallace uh, because we got into the Zach Eady of it all. I wasn't able to ask him about this whole Jonte Porter situation and the reported NBA investigation on betting. I'm going to ask Gary Parrish about it. He's going to join us next. We have a lot to get to with Gary. We'll talk to him about the men's Sweet 16, his takeaways from week one of the NCAA tournament, and we'll get into everything else we could possibly get into with GP when we come back. Let's face it. 
There's a lot of trash talk in basketball, but the great teams let their performance do the talking. Like Ford F-150 with Pro Power on board, a class-exclusive industry-first feature that turns your truck into a mobile generator and leaves the competition speechless. Ford F-150, official truck of the Grizzlies. Greatness starts here at your Mid-South Ford dealer. Classes full-size pickups under 8,500 pounds, GBWR. Grizzlies fans know it's the team that gives you the edge. Big River Steel does too. That's why we're recruiting the best talent to help us develop the sustainable steel needed for today and tomorrow. Join us at the edge of the future. Visit www.bigriversteel.com backslash join to join our Dash team. That's www.bigriversteel.com backslash join to join our Dash team. It's more fun to be there live to see the Memphis Grizzlies hit the court all season long. From the electricity and FedEx Forum to the highlight reel plays, there's nothing quite like Grizzlies basketball. As the official marketplace of the Memphis Grizzlies, Ticketmaster gets you in with a huge selection of seats. So get off the couch and into the stands while you still can. Score tickets today at Ticketmaster.com. That's Ticketmaster.com. Now for a limited time, the new $1.99 Crispy Tender Wraps are here at Sonic. Who could deny a crispy chicken tender with bold flavors like hickory barbecue and cheesy Baja? And we can't forget the crisp lettuce and melty cheese to make the perfect bite. Wrap yourself up with some TLC, tender, love, and chicken for only $1.99. Sonic $1.99 Crispy Tender Wraps. Tax not included, limited time only at participating Sonic drive-ins. Looking for the hot hand. Jared got the step, Woo! got the flush. There's no layups on that one. Electric, rowdy, intense. They bring the same mentality that they bring anywhere into the building. If they were mad about something, they're bringing it in. If they were happy about something, they're bringing it in. So we need all that energy times a thousand. Did you do anything in that St. Joe's game? No, I was strictly playing defense. Delonte West was tough. That's a pro. Oh my God, that step back in that. Oh wait, hold on. Forty minutes. You didn't even get a rest. No, I you played, played the whole 40. game. Six for eleven from the field. That was me. Twelve points, six rebounds, five assists. Oh, I was nice that game. <laughs> I thought I ain't getting double figures. The Chris Vernon Show, presented by Caesar Sportsbook, live weekdays at noon on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Did I invent this? Loki? Did you? I spent years calling my ex-producer Cowboy Carson and now Beyonce. She Didn't decides she, she, wants wind? To, she wants to dabble in country in the genre. Now she's calling her album Cowboy Carter. When she's doing her next concert That's and right. she says, hey, my new album's about to come out. Uh, inspired. Cowboy Carter. I inspired just, by the Gary Parish Show. Shout out GP in yeah. Memphis. The Gary Parish Show, live weekdays at 10 a.m. on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Welcome back. You might think it's Monday. It's not. It's Tuesday, but Gary Paris joins us in studio a day later than normal because he was working till 5 a.m. Sunday mm. into Monday. Now mm. I found out he just got back to Memphis sometime after midnight mm. last night, and yet he is sitting here in studio this morning. GP. I don't have anywhere else to sit. Okay. This is as good a place as anywhere else to sit. Yeah, the, the, the quick turnarounds these days. I... I uh, <laughs> I, I don't know why we got home later than normal last night because as soon as I got on the plane, I went to sleep. Mm. And I woke up like a, I don't know, hour or so later, and we were just then taking off. Oh, I so hate I when that happens. Yeah, so I, and then I didn't know who to ask. I didn't know who to talk to. So I don't really know why we were late, other That's than okay. possibly weather. Wind was, was crazy here. It was, today, bu it was very bumpy. It was a bumpy, yeah. a noticeably bumpy flight once I woke up. Yeah, but we landed around midnight. I think, you know, I Ubered home mm. and I got home around 12 45. It went to bed around 3.30, kids up around 6.30, 6.45, and now I'm here. Another full day in front of me. Another full day. I have to be honest. Like I woke up this morning, and I, I did breathe a sigh of relief that I'm not going to watch basketball tonight. There's some NBA games, but for my first time in five straight nights, right. actually more if you include the first four, but like the really wall-to-wall -wall days, because I continued it with the end of the women's second round yesterday. Sure. Um, 
I can just watch something. I haven't watched anything. Right. I, I am like com completely been insulated by basketball, which is how I assume you feel. Do you get any sense of relief, or is it all speed ahead to Sweet 16 in your brain right now? I, I get some relief when I get back out of town. Okay. It, it, coming back home is... Is is what I should do. Uh -huh. It's where I should be, but it complicates everything okay. because, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I'm so used because I was doing shows at 1 a.m. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. I did, we had a television show that started at, at the earliest at 1 a.m. Uh, often 1:15, 1 1:20. It's a full hour, so I wouldn't get back to my hotel till 2:45. There was one night I podcasted till nearly four. I've been going to bed between 5 and 6 a.m., and that's fine as long as you're used to going to bed at 5 and 6 a.m. every right. night, and then you can sleep till 11 or 12, and what I got mm. on that routine over the weekend. Yeah. But you go to bed at 3.30, and you got to get back up at 6.30. That's, mm -hmm. a, you know, that's not good for a man my age, I don't imagine. I, believe, I think health health officials, yeah. smarter, big brain doctors than me, would probably tell you not. Right. But that's okay. It's yeah, March. We it, sleep in April. Yeah, you especially. Sleep in, yeah, with like my buddy John Rossi yeah. said, we sleep in May. And uh, no, in all seriousness, like it'll be fine once I get back to New York. <laughs> like I, you know, once you get I, in your routine. Yeah, once yeah. I get back on a plane tomorrow, <laughs> I get back on a plane tomorrow, and I get there, then um, my shifts become pretty. Sure. Everything becomes pretty structured. It's just the. Uh, from the time I wake up Monday morning to the time I get back to New York on Wednesday mm -hmm. night, it's, it's nonstop. I am constantly impressed how you are able to keep everything in your brain and conceptualize everything and look forward to the Sweet 16. I spent like 30 seconds yesterday calling DJ Burns RJ Burns, sure. and then suddenly in my head I was like, oh, no, 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 it's DJ. When you go past those first and second round games, though, I'm curious, like, is there – a game, are there games that stand out to you or like, oh, those are ones that I will remember? Or do you immediately turn towards, okay, these are the teams that advanced. I can completely wash those games out of my memory I'm bank. a move on guy. Okay. I'm a, I don't, I'm, in fact, I'm terrible. Every once in a while for social media, like our social media people at CBS Sports, they'll be like, hey, GP, um, can we grab you in between half times? Um, we're going to do, a, you know, the, the five greatest players in March Madness history. And it's like I don't know why you know I got to give me twenty minutes because sure. I'll have to do some Google search. I don't I don't right. I don't carry around stuff with me. It makes me feel better forever. Okay. I I know what I need to know for what I'm about to do, and then it's like okay that's over. Now what are we what are we doing mm -hmm. next? Now I need to know everything for that. Okay that's over. What's next? I'm I'm constantly learning and 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 focusing on what's right in front of me. Do that. Move on. Right. But I don't carry a lot of it around, so I don't sit around going. Yeah, that was my favorite game from Thursday, Friday. I'm like, okay, what do we – everything I'm going to have to say going forward is going to be about related. going forward, so yeah. I focus on that. Yeah, I am going to choose to never remember the four games I watched at FedEx Forum yeah. in the first round. But I will remember Houston, Texas A&M, and we almost saw a one seed go down. Mm -hmm. We did not, and instead all the ones and the twos advanced to the Sweet 16 next weekend. Does that say anything larger about the field this year, or is it simply, hey, this is the fifth time since the tournament expanded that we have this situation? I don't think anything that happens in the I, – I, I, I rarely think anything that happens mm -hmm. in the tournament says anything big about anything other than, you know, sometimes it, it looks like UConn is the best team all season or Purdue or Houston, one of those three. Mm -hmm. And in this tournament, at least Purdue and UConn have been completely overwhelming for, for right. their opponents. Um, even in the round of 32 game, they just could have beaten them by however many they wanted to. And in Purdue's case, they did, did. basically. <laughs> so I do think there was something that became clear throughout the four plus months of everything that happened before selection Sunday. And that was what, and that was that Houston, UConn and Purdue in some order were very clearly the three best teams in the country and had separated from the pack. So I'm not surprised that this is one of the you know, a few years where we get to the sweet 16 and all the ones are still alive because I anticipated that. Um, all the twos being alive. It's a pretty chalky sweet 16. Mm -hmm. We only have one double digit seed and it's an ACC program. Um, there are no mid-majors unless you want to call Gonzaga or San Diego State a mid-major. and Feels a little weird at this point. Yeah, they're both like two of the best consistently good programs in America. San Diego State continues to carry the Mountain West on it, its back year in, yeah, year out. Yeah, not for them, <laughs> buddy. So um, I, I, I think we lose the Cinderella aspect mm -hmm. of the tournament, which so many people love. But I can just tell you like the, uh, what, the, the, the nature of Cinderella's, and this is the reason – like, my bosses don't like them. They like them for 
round one. Right. And maybe for round two, but eventually go look at the history of George Mason, uh, St. Peter's. Yeah. Um, they typically, they go, 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 and then it, boom, they get blasted. Somebody just beats them by 30. Loyola, Chicago. Yeah, it, all, it, it typically ends with a blowout, and mm -hmm. blowouts are bad for television. So um, my bosses, like, love because it's basically big brand on big right. brand going forward. We're almost guaranteed to have awesome Elite Eight games in a in a really interesting Final Four. So this is good for, for, for television ratings and that kind of stuff. But I would have liked to have had a Jack Golke Oakland story go forward. Just to have one of those would have been neat. Uh, speaking of Jack Golke, I think he will be haunting John Calipari's nightmares for the rest of eternity. I did love seeing Jack Golke get the Buffalo Wild Wings treatment, which Doug... Eater got when right. he was at St. Peter's. It was almost like the same identical. I saw the two pictures side by side, and it's like it's wonderful to see this side of NIL and brand partnerships right. where someone is able to capitalize off just a tremendous, like one of the better stories of the first and second round. When it comes to Coach Cal, though, he did his radio show last night. I haven't spoken to you since that game, since everything and all the conversations regarding his future at Kentucky popped off after that. He still has not met with the athletic director. Right. I believe they're supposed to meet today. He said all the right things at his radio show last night. He said that that loss still makes him feel physically ill and he is committed to bringing this program back to a Final Four and to bring championships. Is Coach Cal still the coach at the end of today or when he does have this meeting? I think so. Okay. I don't know that he should be, but I think he will be, if only because it's so much easier to bring him back than it is to actually fire him. It's just it's, cheaper too. It, it, well, <laughs> and that's part of the easier yeah. umbrella. It's just easier to say, we'll let you keep doing this because he's got a top five recruiting class on the way. And if you fire him, you know, it's not technically $33 million because there's offset language and it's, but, but that's the big number. It's a lot of, it's yeah. many millions. It's many millions. So you're paying many millions to lose a top five recruiting class and then you don't know who you're going to hire. Um, and it probably won't be who you want to hire. So it's just much easier to keep him. And he's so convincing. Like I always have said this about John. If you ever, no matter what you think of him, and even if you know he's being disingenuous or, or misleading, um, manipulative, he's very convincing in person. Like one of the stories I always told about him was, you know, if, if, you, were, if you were in a room with him and you were like, all right, I'm, I'm going to get out of here. I'll see you tomorrow. And he said, did you get an umbrella? And you'd look outside and go, well, why would I need an umbrella? It's sunny. Well, yeah, but did, you should get an umbrella, you know, you just in case. And you'd look at your app and it would say, there's a 0% chance of rain and you it's well. sunny. I don't, why would I need an umbrella? And by the time he got through talking to you, you'd be like, I guess I'll just grab one just in case. Like he's that convincing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming he's going to get in front of Mitch Barnhart and he will say, all the things he needs to say, and he'll do all the things he needs to do to get another opportunity at this. But it'll be complicated and awkward, and it will not end well. Because these things always go the same way. Once your fan base, once you've been somewhere as long as he's been there, which is now 15 years, mm -hmm. once you've been somewhere that long, and the fan base no longer believes in you, where you can't win them back over with a recruiting class, Hey, look what I got coming. Yeah, we've seen that before. That's the, that looks like the same thing that just lost to Oakland. And before that, St. Peter's. We don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. Once you lose the fans, you never get them back completely. You can get them back by opening the season next season with a win over Michigan State and you're ranked fourth. You'll get them back for a minute. But the second anything goes bad, they're, they're gone again. And it doesn't even matter if next season is good. Like, that never hits reset for you. Yeah. It, it's, next season can be good, and you'll, you'll get another season. But then if the next one's bad, they'll get you then. The next bad season will be your last one. And up until then, you'll just always be waiting for the hammer to drop. So it, this, this will end in divorce. Um, it'll probably just end a year from now or two years from now. And everything between now and then will be people just speculating on when that divorce will come. Eventually, it happens yes eventually <laughs> it happens and you, you hear Kentucky fans some of them try to rationalize yeah. keeping him and I don't even think you have to rationalize keeping him like on, on some very basic level the most sensible thing is probably to keep him it's just an uncomfortable thing mm -hmm. but when you factor in the money and the fact that like the guy is not running your program into the ground this is still a top four seed right. in the NCAA tournament it's just that the, the, the success that that program is used to hasn't been there recently. 
Um, but when you combine everything and then try to make just, okay, here's the pros, here's the cons, what's the smartest thing to do? It probably is mm. to keep him. So you don't have to rationalize it. But when I hear people trying to rationalize, I just think they're always grabbing onto the wrong stuff. Like I saw some Kentucky fans say, well, if, um, if we fire John now, we're going to lose the recruiting class. Well, he will always have a great recruiting class lined up. And when you ever move on from him, you will you, always lose. That's that right. Recruiting class. So yeah. that thing will always be there. It's like, you know, if you were uh, anything else, like, well, if we buy this house, it's going to cost us this much money. Well, it's always going to cost you this much money. It's always going to be something that's there. So that doesn't make any sense yeah. to me. You'll always, yeah, you'll lose this recruiting class instead of another one. But the day he leaves, you'll always lose recruits. Right. And then the other one is, okay, fine, we could fire John Calipari, but then who are we going to hire next? I don't know. But that's such a backwards way and to think of it. And you always have to find who you are going to hire next someday. Yes, and like, it's just a, ba it's just a backwards way of thinking about yeah. it. Think about if you had a best friend and your best friend was convinced that the marriage was over. Uh -huh. and her marriage or his marriage was completely over and this was never going to be good again. But they said, but I'm not going to separate because I don't know who my next boyfriend will be uh -huh. or girlfriend will be you'd be like that doesn't make sense no. like if you if, if you know this thing is over and bad and never going to be good again then get out of this thing and then figure out the next thing when it's time to figure out the next thing right. but you don't hang on to this thing just because you don't know what the next thing is and yet i hear some kentucky fans like well if we don't know who we're gonna if we can't get billy donovan might as well keep john calipari it's a two-step thing is this working and do you believe it can work? Answer those questions. Mm -hmm. and, and then if you got to answer more questions, then answer those. But just focus on this first. And I think if you're honest with yourself, it's probably not going to ever be what it once was or what they're imagining it could be again. It might be good enough to put it off for a year or two, but this is going to end you know, the Some way. way. It, yeah, it, it, and, and sooner rather than later. Uh, noted. Memphis rival, deep American Athletic Conference rival, FAU, yes. lost their coach, they did. Dusty May, to CJ's Michigan. He mm. will replace Jawan Howard. Yes. He had a lot of interest, whether it be Louisville, reportedly, or Vanderbilt. He has now had to come out and say, I never received death threats from <laughs> Louisville, which is a wild thing for a coach to have to address after taking the job at Michigan. What do you think of the fit? Did it make sense to you? It really felt like it came out of nowhere? I don't think it came out of nowhere, but... And I always assumed Michigan was an option. Okay, At even least. though it wasn't publicly an option? Well, what, once Jawan was out, and Michigan's a big job, right? and it's a Big Ten job, and Dusty is from that area of the country, and graduated from a Big Ten school. I, 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 I thought, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to speak out of both sides of my mouth here. Sure. I thought he was going to be the Louisville coach. Yeah. And I thought that as recently as, you know, five days ago. Mm -hmm. It's one of those deals, though, when you l talk about it, it, with the benefit of hindsight, and you look at it a little more closely, it makes sense. I want to be clear. I think seven out of ten people, if offered the Louisville job or the Michigan job, would probably take Louisville over Michigan. But Dusty is – he's sort of a laid-back guy. He doesn't need to be the face of anything. He doesn't – like John, the way John Calipari – flourished for a long time as the face of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And by extension, on some level, the face of college basketball. Dusty doesn't need that. Okay. If you are at Louisville, you're the face of a university. You just are. You're the most famous person in a city comparable to this city. It's a little bit like being the head coach at the University of Memphis. You are the most famous person in the city. I don't know if that's true with Memphis anymore because of John ja Morant. But once upon a time, if you're the Memphis basketball coach, you're the most famous mm -hmm. person in the city. That's still true at Louisville. Beyond that, which I don't think he'd be – I don't know that he wouldn't be comfortable in that. I just think he'd be more comfortable being the basketball coach at an incredible institution where football is what everybody actually cares deeply about. Uncertainty with the ACC, you don't even know what that's going to look like. Clemson wants to leave. Florida State wants to leave. Yeah, right now you're in a league with Duke and Carolina at Louisville. Yeah. You could end up in a league with Virginia Tech and Memphis like the old Metro. You don't know. So I think just the stability. Mm. The University of Michigan such a big thing. Um, the Big Ten's going nowhere and only getting bigger and stronger. Um, I just think that the structure in place, the stability in place, probably suits Dusty a little more than Louisville does. Okay. I wanted to get your take on one final thing, non-college basketball related, mm -hmm. which I know that's like the entirety of your brain oh, at I got, the moment. I got, I got, my brain goes other But places. I think we're in this very interesting place because you're not a big sports better, right? Uh, he, I, would you consider yourself a huge sports better? Huge. I, 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 yeah, yeah. You dabble. I dabble. You dabble. I dabble. Okay. 
I mean, how about this? I'm not, I'm not betting 15 games a day or even games every day. Okay. But, like, if I got a night off and I'm sitting around the house and stuff on, sure. But yeah. there are also, I can go five days without placing a bet as well. Okay, so you, you're not calling the hotline. I got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Point being, sports betting has taken over a very interesting part of the sports conversation from a variety of places. We had Shohei Otani have to sit down yesterday and talk about how his friend and interpreter stole this money from him to pay off gambling debts. We've now had various instances in the NBA over the last week. The biggest, of course, probably being the Jonte Porter news from yesterday that the NBA is investigating a betting situation where he was allegedly um, maybe a little invested in prop bets on himself, mm -hmm. particularly an instance where a lot of people were betting the under right. on Jonte Porter, and then he had an eye issue about four minutes into a basketball yeah. game, and he left the game, and it ended up being like the biggest winner for betters that night. He had another one where he left a game sick, but we had J.B. Bickerstaff say that someone had tried and come to threaten his family from a gambling standpoint. We had Tyrese Halliburton say that he feels like he's just a prop. It just feels like it's everywhere right. all of a sudden. Yes, CJ. Speaking of this, did you know you can tip players in March Madness now? No. Yes, there's an, an app where you're gambling. Like, yo, yeah, oh, I won because Caitlin Clark did this, the overhit. Hey, Caitlin, here's a little something for no. you. No. Yes. No. Yes. Well, and, and even we talked about this yesterday. Like Reese Davis made a comment that he had to make yeah. an apology for calling uh, UConn Northwestern like a guaranteed investment. Right. There is no such thing as a guaranteed investment. But like, what does this all mean right now? There's definitely a crescendo occurring, and it makes complete sense that it would start bleeding into the sports themselves. But I don't really see a way out. Well, the the thing is, it's so regulated now. Like, this stuff has probably always happened. Yeah, of course. Um, it's just happened in the dark. Well, now there's so much information that's shared between these sites and uh, more than I can even get into. But, right. like, if you as an employee of the Memphis Grizzlies went on FanDuel and placed an NBA bet, like, right now, it would flag it immediately. Yeah. They would, they would, HR I'd would, be in HR like it's so fast yeah, like that's the i don't know why people nowadays think they can get away with this type mm -hmm. of stuff because everything is so regulated um so i don't we'll see where the jante porter stuff goes but this was always going to lead to these types of situations you know he's not making a lot of money relative to um what profession sure. what we think of professional basketball players typically make and so does he have a gambling problem? Is he in debt? If so, somebody approaches you and say, man, all you got to do is get into a game and then stra strain something. Yeah. And all these unders will hit and you're good with me. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm not suggesting that's what happened but, here. But in a hypothetical world. Yeah, that's a, that's a very easy, easy uh, sure. thing that, that could happen. It's not hard to imagine something like that. So um, we will we're, – we're in – uncharted territories with mm -hmm. this stuff you know the gambling has never been so accessible mm -hmm. in the united states and I, you know I, I i think anybody who understands the industry probably could have predicted we were going to have some of these and and then we'll course correct so what does that look like we might reach a deal where the the fan duels and the draft kings they say okay we're not going to have uh props for role players anymore because that can be <laughs> i don't know where this goes but you know we're learning as we go and what we're learning yeah. is that uh, greed is still a big thing in this You're world. not good enough for prop bets. I'm so sorry. Well, my man, thought, my man <laughs> thought that he could get away with placing, or somebody thought they could get away with placing large amounts of money on him. On Jonte Porter, on and it John wouldn't Porter. Flag. It's the same thing Twice as Alabama baseball. Like, yeah. Who's betting on Alabama SEC baseball in betting, the spring? Not, not a little bit like large, some, like the house on Alabama baseball well, or against thing. Alabama yeah, baseball. They know what they, that's the other thing. Like, they know what a normal – Iowa women's basketball game sure. is going to get, right? They know, like, uh, uh, okay, Caitlin Clark's playing basketball today on Fox. Here's the numbers the, uh, th that are going to be wagered on that typically. And if it ever goes, boom, red flag, let's look at this. Yeah. Like that, you, you see basketball games get pulled off the board. Um, I think it was in the conference tournament. Like was it Temple or yeah yeah it's just like they there's something Temple, not right, there's something not here mm -hmm. there's something not right here let's pull it off the board and take a closer look at it so Jonte Porter won't be the last to find himself right. in this situation but I do think players are going to realize this is it, 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 maybe it's not impossible to get away with 
but it's more difficult than you think. How to get away with murder turns into how to get away with sports betting in today's day and age. I think murder might be easier. I don't know. Ask Viola Davis. She killed somebody? Mm, those kids killed a lot of people on how to get away with murder. I didn't watch they were that. always murdering people and then trying to get away with it. I didn't, I didn't, well, it you I, weren't a Shonda fan? I'm not, I'm not going to be labeled that way. Actually surprises me. I'm not going to be labeled that way. Mm. I'm just saying I never watched that show. I don't know why I would have assumed, and that's the problem with when you assume, Gary. Mm -hmm. You make an ass out of you and me. Right. I just thought you would have been on that scandal how to get away with murder path. And I only think that because you're... Married to a woman. I am married to a woman. And I know my husband had to adjacently get sucked into the Shondaverse. He never entered Grey's Anatomy territory, but Scandal and How to Get Away with Murder were in that. We don't watch that. TV shows together like that. Oh. Uh, you're one of those couples. We're one of those, because we can't ever stay on the same page. Well, you have to get on another flight, so it all makes sense. I know, we're never, <laughs> we can never get on the same page, and then she'll be like, uh, and then I watch things very like I need to I need to see everything and, and hear every word. Okay. And she doesn't. Oh. And that's frustrating to me. Yeah, and, but, that's hard. but she can keep up without seeing everything, and okay. I can't. Okay. If I don't see everything, I get lost. She doesn't get lost though. We're not great at watching things together. Well, you're so close to being able to watch other things. I can't wait. Again, I can't wait to give you a list of recommendations. Oh, it's we'll do be a great. whole segment on oh, it's TV be and movies. Gary needs to catch oh, up that's on. GP be paradise. I hope you enjoy. The rest of the I'm day. I'm not going to enjoy the rest of the day. There's an, I'm not. I'm not going to enjoy the I rest of the day. I say this in like the nicest way possible because I, I hate when people say this to me. It really, really makes me mad. You look a little tired, GP. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You look yeah. a little tired. I am a little tired. I can imagine. I, I can am imagine. a little tired. I'm not going to have fun the rest of the day. Okay. I'm not looking forward to it. Okay. I'm not looking forward to anything anymore. That's great. I'm done looking forward to stuff. It sounds a little I'm, worrisome. I'm over it. Okay. All right. We're going to take a quick break. All right. We're going to come back. It's TV Tuesday. We're going to talk about the Nickelodeon documentary that CJ and I both watched on Max called Quiet on Set. Some other shows that we're watching. I learned about a new show on Netflix called Chicken Nugget where somebody's daughter is turned into a chicken nugget. It's a real show. It sounds fascinating. We'll get into it after a quick break. It's South Korean. It sounds cool. Looking for a full court dining experience? Dribble over to Southland Casino Hotel, your ultimate gaming oasis in West Memphis. As a proud sponsor of the Memphis Grizzlies, we're inviting you to savor the flavors at our eight incredible dining venues. Ignite Steakhouse is where culinary excellence gets grilled. Indulge in charcoal grilled steaks and farm to table favorites, perfectly paired with wine or handcrafted cocktails. Enjoy an all access buffet experience at the kitchens or revel in comfort food and Southern classics at the fry house. If casual is more your thing, sample the innovative fare at Seasons Cafe, while Chairman's Bar and Charred Oak Bourbon Bar serve up cocktails and live concerts every week. For those on the go, The Grind is your one-stop coffee shop with gourmet brews and grab-and-go goodies. And of course, we can't forget the Sports Bar and Grill, where you can catch all the Grizzlies action with the best pub fare in town. At Southland Casino Hotel, we've got the perfect dining experience for you, so come on down and ignite your taste buds today. Must be 21 plus, play responsibly for help quitting. Call 800-522-4700. Grizzlies fans know it's the team that gives you the edge. Big River Steel does too. That's why we're recruiting the best talent to help us develop the sustainable steel needed for today and tomorrow. Join us at the edge of the future. Visit www.bigriversteel.com backslash join to join our dash team. That's www.bigriversteel.com backslash join to join our dash team. We know there's only one team you want to watch, and Valley Sports is the place to get your Grizzlies. Experience the comebacks, the buzzer beaters, the can't-miss Memphis-made moments live. Valley Sports keeps the grind going before and after the game, too, with Pete, Brevin, Fish, and Chris on Grizzlies Live. Watch Grizzlies basketball all season long with Valley Sports and streaming on the Valley Sports app. Valley Sports, home of the only team you want to watch. 
Sauced by Will Smith is taking the championship taste of FedEx Forum. Come enjoy your favorite lineup of sauces on traditional and boneless wings the next time you see the Memphis Grizzlies play. All of your favorite sauces, including the famous Garrick sauce, are now available as you cheer the home team on. Visit Sauced by Will Smith inside FedEx Forum at your next Grizzlies game or come visit us anytime at our location in South Haven, Mississippi. Championship sauce, championship taste. Come get sauced today. Did you do anything in that St. Joe's game? No, I was strictly playing defense. Delonte West was tough. That's a pro. Oh, my God. That step back. In that oh, wait, hold on. 40 minutes. You didn't even get a rest. No, I you played the whole 40. game. Six for 11 from the field. That was me. 12 points, six rebounds, five assists. Oh, I was nice that game. <laughs> I thought I ain't getting double figures. The Chris Vernon Show, presented by Caesar Sportsbook, live weekdays at noon on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Gary Parrish for taking time out of his very busy March schedule to come in studio today. Uh, getting into TV Tuesday, before we get into the dark grossness of Quiet on Set, the Nickelodeon documentary, I did hear about this show yesterday, and it honestly intrigued me enough that I think I'm going to watch it. It's called Chicken Nugget, CJ, and it is a South Korean comedy mystery TV series that just dropped on Netflix. It came out last week, and it's gaining some buzz. But here is the plot. Chow Minya, the daughter of a company president, and please excuse my pronunciation if it is wrong, uh, mistakes a new machine as a device which helps her with her fatigue, but she is accidentally turned into a chicken nugget as her father and an intern who has a crush on her try to turn her back into a human. They discover unexpected secrets. <laughs> It's honey, I shrunk the kids, but, but chicken, a chicken nugget. nugget. Like, no, I'm good. If you could turn into any food, what would it be? Oh, I can't do that because I'd eat myself. I think like I'd be a chicken nugget. I listen, if I a pizza, a chili cheese dog, right? Like those are my favorite foods. Some some nachos would be be good. But again, I would eat myself if I became a, a chili cheese dog. So I don't need you to be one. You can't eat yourself. I don't if have you're a, a chicken nugget, you don't have arms. <laughs> it would be really difficult Man, to eat listen, yourself as a chicken nugget. I got a big ass mouth, dog. I can fit a whole lot That's in That's some that. serious flexibility. Yeah. Anyway, you people say if you love outrageous comedies, you should check it out. And a lot of South Korean programming on Netflix has been a giant hit. So I'm just here to tell you early, chicken nugget on Netflix. Watch it. I, I want your review of it. I'm not, okay. you can't, you're not going to convince me to watch it, but I do want your review of it. Okay. Did you ever finish Carol and End of the World? I have two episodes left. Okay. It's been tough. Uh, so add this one to I it. can't watch. I, I still haven't been able to go back to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I started that Truman Capote the, and the Swans, Ryan Murphy show on FX. I'm one episode into that. Chris and I are waiting to start Shogun and The Regime after we finish The Sopranos, which we're in the last season of The Sopranos and need to get back to that once we're not watching basketball again for a moment. I feel like there's other shows that I've missed I told, as well. I, I told you about Carol in the End of the World a long time ago. I've watched... I have okay. two episodes right. left. And it's, it's but only that was like minutes. my midday workout show. Gotcha. And let's be honest, this part of the season, the midday workouts have turned into midday naps. So it's been a little bit of a difference. Anyway, I will watch Chicken Nugget on Netflix if it is the last thing. Well, I'm not going to say that because that sounds very daunting. And right now it's busy enough that it will probably take me two months to watch it. That said, I did watch the Quiet on Set Nickelodeon documentary that came out on Max, which focuses on the absolute disgusting behavior, predatorial behavior that happened on Nickelodeon sets back in the 90s and the 2000s. A lot of it uh, is featured on Dan Schneider, who was the creator of all that and went on to create The Amanda Show and Drake and Josh and Victorious and was one of the most influential figures in kid TV programming, especially like rea real actors, not animated series for kids on Nickelodeon in this case. Um, also within that were the charges of Brian Peck, who worked for Nickelodeon, who sexually abused a variety of children, including the big reveal within the documentary was 
Drake Bell from Drake and Josh, who did appear within the documentary, was probably the biggest name to appear in the documentary. Uh, it's just horrific. It's one of those things where you look back and for me watching it being transported to some of those shows, like I wasn't all that kid. I went to Nickelodeon Studios. I got slimed when I was a kid. It was one of the greatest days of my life at Universal Studios when I was, you know, under the age of 10, growing up on Amanda Bynes and her comedy and being like, oh my God, women can be funny. This is incredible. And then seeing, you know, where her life is now and, and just the, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like the tragedy, frankly, that happened to so many of these kids who thought that they were living their dreams, families thought that they were living their dreams in the entertainment industry, and they were being preyed upon, and they were being put in situations. I never realized how many uh, feet were on Nickelodeon in these programmings, particularly women's feet, and how many like porn-related jokes we were watching when we were kids, and just seeing it and laughing and being like, ha-ha, and now looking at it now, and just feeling like, Ooh. Those jokes go over your head. I'm fine with those jokes. <sighs> I, I am. Like, there, there are jokes that are there. Shrek does this a lot where there are jokes there for the children and then there are jokes there for older people. Can I push back on that on one thing? Go ahead. Like, I, I agree. And even as you're growing up with Disney movies, right? Like, I don't know if you and your friends did this, but going back and seeing that, like, the phallic nature of the castle in The Little Mermaid or that it says sex in the clouds in The Lion King. Allegedly. Like, allegedly. Allegedly. Reportedly. Reportedly. Uh, that all feels very innocuous compared to, like, young girls being put in positions where, like, liquids are being doused on their face and it's imitating fill in the blank imitating oh you money know. shot yeah got yeah, you yeah. um yeah but as a kid that for me i didn't watch any of these shows because i had aged out of nickelodeon yeah. by the time these come through but to me those were just like oh somebody got slimed in the face somebody got hit in the face like that that's how a kid would per perceive it i would think now how a grown-up would perceive it is completely different and if you're the type of grown up who likes to see that happening to little girls yeah. then like that's that's a, a a a problem there was a lot there that my wife admittedly admit my wife has had to explain what a lot of this stuff is to me cuz I didn't I was like oh why is that what's wrong with that explain it to me there was one where he is like fully clothed in the hot tub with Amanda Bonds, who's in her bathing suit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't understand what's going on here. And she had to walk me very slowly through. I was like, oh, now I get it. The power dynamic is, is such to where the kids couldn't say, hey, we're not comfortable doing this. You saw that come to light with the peanut butter, right? right. Like, we're not comfortable doing this. But they couldn't go to him and say that because he controlled literally their livelihood, their family's livelihood in their futures right yes. so but that's so all of it is bad everything about it is is bad um the pedophilia portion dan is not accused of any of that no but the pedophilia portion of it is just why we see so many like child stars grow up and we're like oh they lost their mind they had too much success as a, at a young age oh, or they lost their mind their parents were too controlling no, they are they are acting out of out of abuse. They they were abused on these sets. And it's 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 sad, man. Like you said, it's it's tragic to think that like Drake Bell was somebody who just wanted to act. That's something he loved to do. And he was preyed upon by this grown ass man as a teenager. And I, I felt bad for him and his entire family, particularly his father, where the way that they end up, the way that what's my man's name, the pedophile? The second pedophile. Right Bet the way that he ends up getting Drake is by driving a wedge between Drake and his father, and Drake and his Drake's father and mother are split. They're divorced, and then convincing the mother to allow Drake to come over. Right, like that's how it happens. And as a father, who all you want for your kid is the best for him. You want to keep them safe for the father to be going through the process of trying to protect his mm -hmm. son, only to find out like, yo, this this happened to yeah. my kid. Like that's rough. When he when he cried during that that uh interview i was like yo that's that's tough yeah. that's and he rough. he even said like a reason why he did the documentary was because he knows his dad shoulders a lot of the blame mm -hmm. and he wants it to be clear like how these things happen and it doesn't just fall like even the most loving protective well-meaning of parents can find themselves in a situation where their child is horrifically abused and it was really hard to watch it's I think the first time, when it comes to Dan Schneider, who, again, as you said, ha has not been right. accused of 
abuse created a generally toxic workplace. Well, he's he's, he's um, abusive. Fostered, right. Like, he, not accused of pedophilia. Sure. He absolutely abused the two women uh, yes. who worked under him, and he abused they, those. He forced those two women to share a salary. I, uh, shared so, hey, we want to have a women writer. We, look at us. We're going to have two women writers, but you guys get to share a salary. And we're going to put you guys in incredibly uncomfortable. I am going to put you mm -hmm. in incredibly uncomfortable situations regularly. And that just ugh, and was I mean, not, awful to listen the, to. The but abuse went to the kids sure, also. Just it trickles in, down. Like the, I, I felt for some of the black characters, not yes. characters, but some of the black people right. who are talking about their experiences, like dealing with racism, man. Like being yeah. cast as a 10, 11 year old as somebody who's pushing Girl Scout cookies, uh, pushing, you know, like drugs, like mimicking mm -hmm. that and, and other things that happened on that set. And you can watch the, the documentary. Yeah. I don't want to give too much away from you. I, I felt where the mom was coming from when she was like, yo, that was like my kid. He shut down after that. Like mm -hmm. he he didn't trust anybody after that. And that's kind of what ends up happening yeah. for some people where once you encounter that first taste of racism. It's like, yo, we're, I'm done with this. I can't trust anybody. My yeah. parents can't protect me from this. I've got to wall myself off and, and become a much harder version of myself. And the favoritism at play. And that mom feeling like she couldn't call out some of the icky behavior that she saw because she was concerned that her son would get even less opportunities. I mean, it just sets a really poor structure of a work environment. And uh, the cr there were a lot of crazy things. That Brian Peck having a signed piece of art from serial killer John William Gacy just was just an absurd anecdote. Like, documentaries give you these absurd anecdotes every now and then where you're like, what the hell? That was that one um, because I think that would be a giant red flag. And then Amanda Bynes is not in the document. Like, she was not interviewed for the documentary. She turned down the documentary. There's so much speculation in the Amanda Bynes of it all. I don't know if you have followed where Amanda Bynes is now, but she has significantly struggled. Um, she has been well, I know forward about being diagnosed as bipolar. Um, she has fought against her parents for years. There used to, there was a time in like 2012, 2013, where people thought that it was an Amanda Bynes burner account on Twitter where she was calling out Dan Schneider, like the Harvey Weinstein stuff is popping off and she is, and again, this is all just, it was never proven that it was Amanda Bynes Twitter account, um, but people thought that it was and calling out Dan Schneider for similar behavior, calling out her parents for setting herself up to be financially dependent on them and trying to hold on to that and not allowing her to be emancipated for a long period of time. Um, but I remember showing up when I was at USC, Amanda Bynes was at FITM, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. And Amanda Bynes would be at parties in L.A. and you would see her and you'd be like, that's not Amanda Bynes. And it was. And it was like this running joke of like, oh, my God, have you seen what happened to Amanda Bynes? And now it, just, it feels so horrible because you're like, oh, my God, like what this young woman went through, how that has affected who she is today. She started to try um, a podcast a couple of months ago. She just like couldn't do it. Un completely understandable. Um, but, man, it just it makes... The memories of your childhood become so clouded in just disgusting behavior that it's kind of difficult to conceptualize it all. I mean, I, the the Amanda Bonds piece of it is is interesting because I think that was the end game with Drake, which is, hey, declare yourself grown, become emancipated so that I can prey on you mm -hmm. more readily and more more easily. And some of the times with these emancipation things, um, some people are jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Yes. Right. It's like, I don't want to be under my parents' control. I want to work as much as I want to work. And then you get it. And then boom, that's when the people who were telling you to do it, they lead you down a path of, of abuse. And that's, that's sad. And I wish all of them the best. I wish all of the kid actors and all the people that were wrong, the, the best uh, Schneider Peck, the other guy can go rotten hell for, for all I care. And this is the, 2018, I sent you the story about yeah. the, 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 I'm blanking on my man's name, um, Ren and Stimpy founder. John Crickfallacy. So he he does Ren and Stimpy, and it is so revolutionary at the time. And then there's a split up at Nickelodeon because he's always late on new episodes. Mm -hmm. But he's preying on people 13. He's reaching out to, to girls at 13 years old, helping them set up AOL accounts and writing them things and telling them things like, oh, I feel funny in my chest when I see you. Do you feel and that? And first Do you telling feel them, tingly? I'm going to make you be a cartoonist. Yeah. So I'm going to help gonna, you out. I'm going to help you. Right. And then, hey, I feel tingly when I talk to you. Do you feel tingly? And molesting one that we know of 
at 15, 16 years old and just all of this type yeah. stuff going on. So Nickelodeon has two situations with a handful of, of people that we, we know of. Um, and so here's, here's hoping that's it, but I doubt, yeah. I doubt very seriously that that's it for, for Nickelodeon. Well, and we know that like a lot of the Disney Channel stars have NDAs. They have alluded to those NDAs. So don't think that it just affects one industry. Right now, the spotlight is on Nickelodeon. And as Ben in the chat points out, like Dan Schneider is terrible, but there were others around him in positions of power who knew and did nothing and are probably still making money. That is always going to be one of the more disgusting facts when these things come out like Nickelodeon has all of it now and that Ren and Stimpy creator like that article was from 2018 and now it's recirculating and being pointed out like we've seen this in industry after industry after industry this is a societal problem and right now it is glaring on the child entertainment side of things and there's a lot of abuse and a lot of gross inappropriate illegal behavior that has occurred um and we'll see where it goes next. And that, that's the worst part. It's like, okay, well, what are we going to find out next? Because there's always another one. We always find out another one, whether we're in sports or politics or church or your neighbor or your family or someone you know's family. Like, it's out there. And it's gross. CJ, what else hey, are you watching? The, the next one is Diddy, isn't it? Like, that's the one happening now. True. That's the, Fair that's pivot. the one. We can't get all the way through this. I can't process this all the way. You're Speaking right. Speaking of childhood being ruined. But right. what am I? What am I watching? Oh, Did we, do we have any update on Diddy this morning? Um, last thing I saw was they see they were going through the mansions to try and get his computer and his phones because that's where the videos are. Last yeah. night somebody was leaking things saying, "Hey, this is the audio from a particular video allegedly involving Puff Daddy and a Philadelphia rapper." Um, so there's there's that. Uh, and if you know the there Philly was that rapper, TMZ you know, uh, was, clip of him wandering around the Miami airport, yeah, pacing back and which forth, which has people wondering what private jet he got on, where he's so flying he, with that private jet. Is he somewhere where he can't be extradited? The the thought is he's in Miami. He loaned his private jet to somebody. That's what some are saying. It, guess where it flew? Yeah, Antigua. Yeah, they don't they don't extradite. <laughs> no. Um, and so, yeah, they're going to see some more stuff. They wanted to get in there before they started destroying stuff, uh, which is, you know, if they're trying to do that, it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. Uh, X-Men 97, though. <laughs> Speaking of my childhood in a good way, X-Men 97, the, the new cartoon on Disney Plus. Oh, it's really, really good. And it's it's got the storm being super strong. It's got, I've never seen this version of Cyclops. I've never seen Cyclops. I thought we just went off be, the air. No, I've never seen Cyclops be a complete and total badass. But Jessica, my man is falling out of a plane. They blow the plane up. He's falling out of the plane. And you're seeing all the characters who can fly go fly and save their fellow X-Men. Nobody touches Scott. Scott just pits his laser beam onto the ground and slows his momentum with his laser beam, creating this great crater lands come to me my x-men like that's an incredible line wolverine is short in this which is what he's supposed to be uh, uh jubilee is actually like actually looks asian in this which is superb the way that they're doing magneto is intriguing will coleman texted me and we'll we'll have to talk to will about this because yes. he does not trust magneto and i can understand why but magneto has always been a character who strikes when hit Right? I'm not gonna hit you, but if you hit me, I'm gonna knock your block off. And I can rock with that line of thinking, I Magneto don't got no cheeks to turn, dog. You strike this cheek on Magneto, he's obliterating you. And I rock okay. with that. So I like what they're doing with Magneto, showing a bit of a softer side, showing a bit of a, a patient side for now. We'll mess it up. People always mess it up. Mm. But for now, there's a patient side to okay. what Magneto has got going on. I love it. Morph is in it, and that allows them people to... People have said great things about oh, it. Oh, because it's, it's, it's great. great. It's great. Uh, one complaint. One complaint. Okay. A tad too much exposition. Mm. A tad too much exposition. I hate I don't, too much I don't, exposition. I, I understand why you have to do it, because if you, I might be able to convince you to watch this. And if I did, I would need the you, exposition. You need the exposition, but for me, Fair. like, no, just just get to okay. it. Stop wasting my time. Uh, the other quick TV hitter, apparently Euphoria Season 3 has been delayed indefinitely by Sam Levinson. He has said, Zendaya, go do whatever projects you want. Jacob Elordi, go do whatever projects you want. Just cancel the show. We don't need Season 3 of Euphoria. I'm done with Euphoria. 
Except I know people would love to see Sydney Sweeney in another show. Anyway, that will do it for today's show. We get a little bit of a college basketball break tonight. I need it. There are some good NBA games. Lakers Bucks at 6.30 Central Time. Mavs Kings at 9. Also, if you're interested in tracking, will the Golden State Warriors make the play-in tournament? They play the Heat tonight. They only have a half-game lead on the surging Houston Rockets right behind them who have won nine in a row. We'll be back tomorrow. It will be a Grizzlies game day. Will it be the Brandon Clark return? turn game against the Lakers. We will find out. It will be a Wednesday. D'Angelo Williams will join us. We'll get into some stories that we have missed throughout the week. Maybe we'll talk about the hip drop tackle. I'm sure plenty of things will come out. Maybe we'll get the Kim Mulkey article. Who knows? We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. You got This work. is exhausting. This what? has been an exhausting 2024. So much has happened already. Oh my You're God. You're only three months in. I know.